Well, so uh, thanks very much for having us. This is joint work with uh, Monica Piazzesi. And it's motivated by some pictures on uh, dollar payments. So in this figure, the left panel has um, payments made by uh, what we call end users uh, by making payment instructions to banks. The blue at the bottom has checks and direct debit credit transfers. The brown is uh, transactions in equity, uh, corporate bond, and mutual fund shares that are cleared in US markets. And the red is uh, for treasury and agency bonds. And so the, you notice the scale is in trillions. And the message of the picture is that even though uh, these uh, say non-financial transactions in blue are about five times GDP, they're small and stable compared to transactions in financial markets. Now, uh, these uh, intermediaries that, that handle these transactions have uh, tools to do netting of uh, transaction against uh, each other. And this means that uh, the effective interbank transactions shown in the right-hand picture uh, that are generated by these transactions on the left are substantially smaller. The color coding on the right has uh, our estimates of what type of transaction on the left generated the interbank transfer on the right. And the point here is that, again, from the, from the colors, the, even after you take into account netting, the uh, uh, securities market transactions generate a lot of interbank transfers compared to other transactions. Uh, what's also in the picture is our estimate of uh, interbank transaction due to Fed funds market activity, and that is a substantial chunk of uh, payments. In particular, before uh, the financial crisis when uh, reserves were relatively scarce. Okay, so this concludes the empirical part of the presentation. The rest uh, is a stylized model of uh, the payment system that has these two layers. There's end users, households and institutional investors, who pay for goods and securities with payment instruments, which we broadly call inside money. And here what we have in mind is uh, there are payments instruments like deposits and money market fund shares that one invests in, but also credit lines that one arranges with uh, intermediaries. Uh, and then uh, there is a bank layer where banks handle these end user payment instructions and they make interbank payments with uh, reserves, or that's the outside money. You know, in our uh, model, there is no currency. It is a, it's a modern uh, world. Um, and so the banks uh, effectively do two things here. Uh, they do liquidity management. They have to decide uh, how much reserves to hold and how much to rely on interbank credit or borrowing reserves. Uh, and they choose capital structure or um, how much of these payment instruments to issue, which is beneficial because it has, they have a liquidity benefit, uh, but they also have a cost of leverage. Um, and uh, then there is a government that issues debt and reserves and trades and securities. And what we're going to do with this model is ask, uh, in, a, in this uh, setting with these two layers, where there's a component of securities market trading in this end user layer, um, what is the interaction between securities markets and the payment system? How does policy affect asset prices and the nominal price level? And what does an efficient payment system look like? Okay, so this is a 20 minute presentation, so I'll try to do it without equations. There's plenty of those in the paper, uh, but this is, will just be pictures. So here, uh, th this is a, the, the baseline model where uh, only goods transactions require inside money. And so um, there are uh, three uh, types of uh, assets that are in non-zero net supply. There's trees, uh, some of which could be held by banks. Think of this as houses and mortgage bonds that are written on the, that can then be held uh, by the banks. There's uh, government debt and there's reserves. And then households can invest in uh, these, these assets either directly or they can go through banks. And that in turn they can do either by uh, holding equity or by holding deposits. Um, the blue arrows indicate uh, investments that, that uh, give liquidity benefits. So banks, as we said, pay with reserves and households pay by making instructions based on deposits. Um, now then we're gonna have an extension in which now also the asset trades are gonna require inside money. So there's a bunch of uh, asset management firms that actively trade and uh, households invest in those. And then those also uh, require uh, liquid instruments from banks uh, in order to run their strategies. Uh, the, uh, the model is set up so that the holding of uh, deposits 
is equivalent uh, at the, the, the appropriate pricing to the banks providing credit lines to either households or active traders. So when we say payment instruments, you should think broadly of not only sort of a broad money supply, but also unused uh, loan commitments that are outstanding and that, that can be uh, quickly used to pay. Okay, so let me give a, this is the, is the, the basic structure. Let me, let me summarize the, the main ingredients uh, again. So there's households, uh, they're infinitely live, they're gonna have linear utility, and they're gonna be averse to nighty and uncertainty. This is our way to, to introduce shocks in asset markets uh, that, that move prices. Um, and then uh, these households pay for goods with inside money. Um, there's these two types of financial institutions, banks and the active traders. They're both uh, uh, competitive firms that maximize shareholder value, they can freely adjust equity, and they operate under constant returns. Um, they get idiosyncratic liquidity shocks, uh, and those require payments. And then banks pay with reserves that must possibly be borrowed, and the active traders pay with inside money uh, that comes from the banks. And then the banks uh, incur a leverage cost. And by this we mean uh, whenever you make a commitment, then there are some resources that get used up. Uh, this could be because uh, before you make the commitment, you have to make a costly signal, or after you make the commitment, then it has to be broken and there is a bankruptcy cost. Um, so this leverage cost stands in for these, for these two possibilities. And it is increasing in the amount of commitments that are made, and that means here interbank credit, borrowing, uh, as well as inside money, including the provision of credit line, which also involves a commitment. Um, and uh, it declines with the value and the safety of the bank's assets. So if uh, the bank has more collateral or more valuable collateral, uh, then it is uh, cheaper to make commitments. Now, the government sets the interest rate on reserves. It uh, sets paths for short-term debt and for reserves. And uh, the government also, uh, we view as a, a firm that has uh, leverage costs. And if you extend the government debt too much, then this cost goes up. Uh, the collateral of the government is different uh, from that of banks because the government has a power to tax. And so uh, leverage cost declines with, with claims on future taxes. Um, we, we look for competitive equilibria with flexible prices. And so the model determines inside money supply, the normal price level, and then real asset prices as well as the share of resources that's used up as leverage costs. And so when we talk about efficiency, the, the question is, uh, how can we handle the transactions that are useful in the economy with the minimum amount of uh, leverage cost that, that's incurred? <laughs> Let me sketch how the uh, determination of uh, prices works. So the nominal price level in this economy uh, comes off of a quantity equation. Uh, so we set uh, the velocity, uh, we, we bake it in to be constant, so as to zero in on the new elements, which are first that there is this, uh, sort of this bank supply of inside money, um, that is uh, the, so the blue effects or the money supply. Um, and so that consists of deposits and these credit lines. Um, and then uh, the transactions that, are, uh, that, that this is used for include this institutional investor trade. So this green, this is, this is a money demand part. And then uh, because the uh, the uh, supply, this inside money is something that's endogenous and responds to the amount of collateral that's available to banks, the inflation rate is going to follow from the growth rate of the nominal government liabilities, so the, the, the total, um, and not just from the, the growth rate of, the, of narrow money. Um, in fact, uh, the opportunity cost of uh, payment instruments, uh, that differs across layers. So for the inside money that's used in the end user layer, it depends on uh, what's the cost of bank's leverage and provision of liquidity. Whereas uh, for the reserves that are used in the bank layer, the opportunity cost depends on what's the real return that the government sets by setting an interest rate on reserves and by determining the growth of uh, uh, inflation, or determining the inflation rate by the, the growth rate of these nominal liabilities. Um, <coughs> Now, the interesting asset pricing in this uh, model is uh, intermediary-based. Uh, uh, so there are standard uh, Euler equations that, that price assets do not hold for two reasons. One is that uh, banks value uh, assets as collateral because they, they're useful to produce these payments instruments. Um, that uh, generates um, endogenously uh, market segmentation, where in particular the short uh, bond market, or the money market, 
uh, is a market where only the banks lend. Uh, and, uh, and then the short interest rate is something that's priced only by banks. Um, and then, so the second effect uh, is that uh, these active traders who use this, the cash as part of their investment strategy, they respond uh, to changes in the uh, cost of inside money. And so these active traders valuation is gonna be higher if the inside money is relatively cheap. Okay, so that's, a, that's another effect uh, on prices that comes from the money demand side uh, that's different. So those are the, that's the basic structure. So now what I wanna uh, do in the remaining time is uh, walk you through a couple of uh, uh, pictures to show you that this is sort of a useful tool to think about uh, a bunch of different things. Um, the model is um, be because we have uh, the, all this linearity built in, uh, one can summarize it so that there's no issue, even though it's a dynamic model with all these idiosyncratic effects and lots of banks and firms and whatnot, it can all be summarized uh, in, in steady state uh, by a, um, just uh, two numbers that we can plot, which is the aggregate bank leverage and the uh, uh, real reserves. And uh, so this, this is what we're gonna use to show. And so this is gonna start with just the, the a good straight only uh, version. So we're gonna um, plot on the vertical axis, uh, bank leverage, and uh, then because the banks price the uh, short debt, the real interest rate is uh, inversely related to bank leverage, so that's on the vertical axis going down. And then on the uh, horizontal axis is uh, real reserves. And uh, there's, there's uh, because of this liquidity management problem, there are two key regions here. If the reserves are, in real terms, relative to the fixed number of transactions are low, then the reserves are scarce. And sometimes when the banks get hit by large liquidity shocks, they have to borrow. This is kind of what the US looked like before 2008, uh, and what Canada looks again like now. Um, and uh, then as you go uh, across, if there's enough reserves, then the reserves are abundant and the bank banks never have to borrow in the course of liquidity management. So that's, that's the threshold. Now the, the, uh, <coughs> the bank's um, decision problem has these two features, it's the, the liquidity management and the capital structure. Let's start with the latter. So we can, we can put two curves. The first one asks the question, what bank leverage does it take in order to handle the transactions T, that's a fixed number, given reserves. Um, this is a curve that slopes down in the plane. That's basically because reserves are one form of collateral. So if there's more reserves, then there's more collateral, so leverage is lower. Um, also, this, is, this curve is steeper if the bank's share of nominal assets is relatively higher. If you think about uh, what, what does it mean to have more real reserves fixing the amount of, of uh, nominal reserves, that means the price level is lower, and then the Nominal collateral is lower, so that makes the, the curve steeper. We're gonna come back to that. That matters for the transmission of policy. Um, the second curve talks about liquidity management and asks the question, um, what leverage does it take to maintain a given return on equity, given reserves? Uh, and this is uh, sloping upwards in the plane because uh, if the reserves are less scarce and it's sort of less useful, uh, then uh, I can have for the same, uh, can I have the same return on equity uh, with, uh, with, with more leverage. Um, <clears throat> so I, I need, in order to sort of this, this useless stuff that I have to hold in order to, uh, for, for that to be sensible for me to do, uh, with this, for the same return on equity, I need more leverage. Um, this, uh, the actual upward slope only arises uh, if the benefit of reserves actually changes, and that happens only when the, the reserves are scarce. So that's where there's an upward sloping piece uh, until the reserves are abundant, and then it flattens out. Uh, so once, the, uh, once we're in the, the yellow region, uh, there's no more liquidity benefit of reserves, there's no more interbank uh, uh, borrowing, and uh, leverage is constant. Um, this is uh, the region formerly known as uh, the zero lower bound. Uh, in this model, as in the world, this, could, uh, this just means that the interest rate on short debt is the same as the interest rate on reserves, and that could be positive as in the US or negative as in Europe or Japan. Okay, so let's talk about some uh, changes in, in, the, in the world uh, that we can do with comparative statics uh, in, in, this, uh, in this model. So the first one is, uh, if we shift up this capital structure curve, that, that broadly reflects uh, we're withdrawing collateral from the banking system, um, then more leverage is needed at any given level of reserves. A prime example of this is an open market purchase of bonds. 
This, so then <laughs> we're doing an open market purchase, then for any given level of reserves, we got fewer bonds. There's less collateral, uh, so the curve shifts up. At the new steady state, we're gonna have uh, a lower real interest rate. There's collateral scarcer now. Uh, people compete for bonds, bid up the prices. Um, and uh, there's also going to be the increase in the price level. That's because there, there was an so open market purchase, so money goes up. But interestingly, uh, the price level increases by less uh, than do reserves, as would be the, the typical case in sort of a standard uh, model with flexible prices. And this is because what matters here for the price level is the inside money. And the inside money depends on collateral. Collateral is less. So, so there is a sort of a sluggish adjustment of prices here. Um, so this is, uh, <clears throat> this is how, how the, the open market purchase works. Notice that these are uh, effects uh, across steady states. So because this is a model with, where the banks are facing financial frictions, there are permanent effects on real interest rates. Um, if we did a very large effect, we could, we could get, the, get this all the way into the um, abundant reserve region. Let me look at the, instead of the shift in the liquidity management curve. So that basically means, uh, suppose we've got a higher real return on reserves. Um, if the real return on reserves is higher, then lower leverage is needed to maintain the same return uh, on equity. Um, and, and we get this downward shift. We could do that by either paying more interest on reserves or by credibly announcing a lower growth rate of uh, uh, nominal liabilities. In either case, what that effectively does is these, these reserves, which are this intermediate good to produce uh, payment instruments, it's taxed at a lower rate. Um, and that means that uh, we get at the new steady state um, an a interest rate that is higher and a price level that is lower. Uh, so that is, that's, the, that's what the downward shift does. Um, the, uh, <coughs> Government can uh, go further. Uh, if it makes a large shift, uh, then uh, that ev eventually makes the reserves abundant. Uh, and, we, and then we enter a region where uh, the, the, uh, <coughs> because, because the, uh, now the uh, short bonds and reserves are perfect substitutes, the uh, conventional monetary policy is no longer effective. Uh, and the policy tools that remain are sort of unconventional trades. Uh, and changes in the real return of reserves, which is what uh, the policy does now. Um, what's, uh, what's interesting, it, what, what comes out in this two-layer structure, is that uh, in order to think about uh, policy that moves the interest rate on reserves and how that transmits to prices, it matters what, is, what banks' portfolios look like, because it matters uh, from the slope of the green curve, this capital structure curve, what is banks' share of nominal assets. Um, if that is uh, larger, um, then the, uh, any response uh, of the price level to changes in the interest rate of reserves is uh, smaller. Okay, so uh, what's, what's best? Well, um, leverage is costly, and so we want to minimize the total cost of leverage. And that means in this uh, picture, basically moving towards the origin. So make, get bank leverage down and get real reserves down, which is, uh, what, which is basically in, uh, contributes to government leverage. Um, so there are some, uh, there's a, uh, one can uh, represent uh, the sort of welfare in the economy using these, these, these uh, curves like the light blue one. And uh, then we get um, an optimum that could be either, sort of a best equilibrium that could be either um, in the abundant reserve region or in the scarce reserve region. And this depends on what's the relative cost of uh, borrowing for the government and the, and the banking system. Okay, so the, the final point uh, is uh, about an increase in uncertainty. Um, so that does two things if we have an economy with active traders present. One is that uh, bank collateral is worth less. This is something that's been talked about a lot, is that uh, when bank collateral goes down, then uh, the supply of, uh, of inside money goes down. Uh, here, there is the additional effect uh, that uh, now there's also lower demand for inside money from these active traders because they don't need to do so much trading. And so the forces on the price level of these two things are in the opposite directions. Uh, so uh, the message here is that the details of financial structure matter if we uh, want to understand the interaction of securities markets and the payment system. So let me sum up uh, what are the takeaways uh, from, from this analysis. Um, so in this, uh, in this world where you have... <clears throat> 
these, these two-layer structure where uh, securities markets uh, traders uh, are also present in the um, in this end user layer. Uh, the interaction ha goes two ways. So there's this, this effect. So the value of bank collateral means the supply of inside money is affected, and the value of institutional investor trades means that the demand is affected, and that has opposite effects of the price level. So structure matters. The government has two tools. It can set the real return on reserves, um, which taxes this intermediate input, and uh, it changes the mix of collateral by trading securities, conventionally or unconventionally. Uh, both of these uh, affect collateral and liquidity benefits of assets and have permanent effects on real asset prices. Uh, that's how the frictions matter. Uh, and another thing that sort of in, is implicit in the discussion that I gave uh, is that the policy stance in this uh, world with frictions cannot be summarized just by interest rate rules. Uh, so we can't uh, just read, uh, use this to summarize everything. It, it matters what is this collateral mix, so quantities matter. Um, finally, uh, should we have regimes with scarce versus abundant reserves? Uh, well, governments can choose to take their economies in, in these directions by, by changing the uh, interest rate on reserves or nominal liabilities. But uh, what is best depends on the relative leverage cost. How, how hard is it to uh, credibly produce a lot of government debt uh, versus a, a lot of having a lot of bank leverage? And in some countries where the government is uh, uh, finds it easy to borrow relative to the banks. This may be, it may be useful to have an uh, abundant reserve regime. In other countries, thinking, say, Greece, this may be harder. Uh, and so it's not clear, uh, in general, uh, where we should go, and it depends on uh, the details of uh, how, what the financial structure looks like. Let me begin by, by um, stating why I think um, starting payments is important and therefore why this paper is important. So the reason is this, that evil is the root of all money. It all begins, you know, several thousand years ago when somebody wanted to trade somebody, something with somebody else and they needed to use uh, some commodity because they didn't trust to be repaid in the future. And then at some point, uh, you know, somebody invented accounting and figured it out, figured out that, um, you know, Instead of having these, uh, you know, commodities circulate, uh, you know, you could actually lend money. And the way you would do it is you would, uh, you know, borrow that commodity, give the, you know, the, the saver a piece of paper, and then lend the commodity to that borrower who could trade in turn. And at some point, uh, e this is evil again, uh, banks figured out that instead of actually lending out those commodities that they have to look for, they could actually lend out the same pieces of paper they were lending the, the savers because they were trading. Um, and so, you know, that's when uh, deposits started uh, circulating. But at the very beginning, in the 19th century, in the U.S. at least, uh, deposits circulated at a discount. Uh, why? Because you didn't know what the bankers were doing, how much uh, commodity they had backing their assets. So, you know, the real revolution comes when banks figured out a way to um, you know, solve this discount problem. And that's when uh, banking systems were created. So what is a banking system? It's a system of joint liability. So banks are unique in the sense that they issue liabilities that are accepted by everybody else as means of payment, but they are deposited at other banks. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and you know that when you get a check from somebody else, you can immediately deposit uh, at some other bank, and then the other bank is liable to, to uh, those losses. Um, why, why is this useful? Because it avoids discounting uh, uh, deposits. Um, so that's, a, that's an advantage for banks, but it also makes the system prone to moral hazard. You know, if you are part of a banking system where some individuals are issuing liabilities that are backed by other individuals of the same club, nothing would prevent, uh, you know, without further frictions, some bank from issuing liabilities backed by bad assets. Uh, that are accepted by, by other banks and become their, their liabilities. So the way to, you know, solve this problem is to, you know, use a system of accounting to see who's issuing more liabilities than others and clearing those liabilities with reserves. But you have to clear them at a penalty rate and uh, that's why you have frictions in the payments system. It's to prevent over issuances. Uh, and, that doesn't, and that means that these frictions can matter a lot. So this is what 
um, this paper is about. So what Martin and Monica's paper do is they work with these two layers, a layer of deposits and a layer of clearing um, of these transactions with uh, reserves at penalty rates. Um, and what they're going to do is characterize uh, real asset prices, the nominal price level, and study some effects of, of policy. And what I think is interesting and unique here is um, the feedback between asset prices and clearing systems. Um, and, and so I'm going to discuss uh, a little bit more of that. Um, their analysis is, is in steady state. So I'm going to strip out some elements of the model and try to underline what, what are the key forces. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is tell you where some pieces that I stripped out are important in their analysis. So <clears throat> their model is purely linear. Everybody's linear. Um, although there is an important element, which is that these leverage costs that Martin was uh, stressing throughout his talk actually introduces curvature uh, uh, at some point in the model. And that's, and that's very important, especially for the effects of policy. Um, so they have a deposit in advance constraint. So you, it's kind of like a cash in advance constraint. That's capturing quid pro quo trade. And there's a risk-free uh, risk bond or risk-free assets, and that's going to allow us to talk about asset implications. And then they have um, a quantity theory equation uh, that allows us to pin down the nominal price level. It's fine to use a velocity of one, I think. So if you look at the household's first order conditions, you know, if, since the model is linear, uh, you would find that um, the, dis the, the, you know, the, the discount rate of the, of the household has two elements. Basically, the, the first order condition of the household will have two Lagrangians. One that is capturing um, the budget constraint, and the second one that is ca capturing the, the cash in advance constraint. The guy has less deposits than what, than what he needs to consume uh, at his first best, then that constraint would be active. And so what is a return on deposit? Um, you can also see it from um, the first order conditions of the household. You see, a deposit to, that you buy today doesn't help you or doesn't have an opportunity cost uh, with um, uh, the consumption today if the cash in advance constraint uh, is binding because you're using all of your resources uh, pinned down by yesterday's inc uh, savings, uh, DT, to, to get consumption. So that's why when you look at the first 30 condition, only the uh, Lagrange multiplier that is associated with the budget constraint is appearing here. But tomorrow, those deposits are allowing you to relax the, uh, the cash in advance constraint. So uh, that is why deposits will earn a lower return than, the, than what you get in the, in the Fisher, from the Fisher equation. You can see it very easily if you look, compare these two Lagrangian, uh, the, the ratio of these two things over these two things. Now, um, when you look at how households price um, uh, assets, then that li extra liquidity uh, benefit, that extra benefit of you have an asset and you can uh, uh, use it to to uh, consume tomorrow is not present, not, um, not, not extra liquidity benefit is not present there because you need deposits to buy those assets. Um, so in steady state, you get a uh, Lucas pricing equation. Um, but it means that um, deposits are return dominated by, by loans, by, by assets. Oops. Sorry. Then you can go to the, to, the, to the banker's problem. And the banker's problem, I, I lay down all of the accounting equations in, in their problem. So a bank will accumulate uh, more deposits if it pays dividends or if it buys assets. So it can issue deposits to buy, um, to buy loans. It will, if it had loans from uh, a previous period, it will lower down its liabilities because it's um, uh, getting a return from past loans, and it can also issue deposits to uh, buy cash. This is before there's any liquidity cost. Um, loans have an accumulation equation, and then the reserves that the bank has come from the purchases in this interbank market. So you issue deposits to get N reserves. That allows you to accumulate more reserves. And the benefit of having these reserves is showed up, showing up in this, is going to be summarized by some liquidity cost function. So this liquidity cost function um, will depend on the assets that the bank accumulated yesterday. If you combine these equations, you can write, it, er, you can write everything entirely in terms of a single budget, budget constraint, where you see um, basically 
two assets for the bank, loans and reserves. Reserves earn a natural return, which is the interest rate on excess reserves, or re uh, in, in the paper. Um, deposits pay an interest rate, there's a, a return on the loan, and then there's this liquidity cost uh, in, in the budget constraint of, of an individual bank. So what is this liquidity cost? You know, that will depend on, on you know, in various environments, but it's safe to make uh, uh, some assumptions here. Wait. Some assumptions. And the assumptions are the following. That the liquidity cost is decreasing uh, in the amount of collateral that there is in the economy. It's increasing in the amount of deposits or in, in the amount of leverage that these banks have. Um, it's decreasing in the amount of reserves that these banks have. And it's increasing in some shocks that the banks can have, so a withdrawal, a large withdrawal. Of, so this means how, my, how many payments the bank has to, has to make. And it's also decreasing or increasing depending, depending on aggregate. And so there are papers that deal with micro foundations of these liquidity costs through search, or there's a classical paper by Poole on well, race and market. And you can summarize everything by this constraint. Um, what, is novel, what is novel in this paper is this, is this feedback between the collateral value um, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the cost of this, uh, of this liquidity. Uh, when Martin was showing you this area where re reserves um, are, are, the cost of reserves are flat, where, where in that curve you had a, that uh, straight area, that's an area where M is sufficiently large so that you can sustain all possible payments. Uh, so for any possible withdrawal, each bank has enough reserves uh, to meet all possible, all, all possible payments. So, if you look at the first order conditions of, these, of the problem for banks, they are all going to have you know, the, the same structure. Each asset is going to have its natural return, but it's going to have a, a little multiplier, which is captured by these elements in the parentheses. And what this multiplier is, is capturing is essentially um, what is the li liquidity value that each asset is bringing. If you have collateral, if you have you know, uh, these assets, you are allow allowed to pledge it as collateral, so it's going to lower the liquidity cost. If you hold reserves, that potentially may earn a low interest rate, but in turn it will spare more than one for one in cost in liquidity. Um, and deposits are costly because although you earn a return on those deposits, in the end those deposits may leave your bank and then you may end up um, suffering payments in that bank. So this gives us a liquidity spectrum, and depending on how big each asset contributes to reducing or incrementing those liquidity costs, you, know, you get a, 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 a spreads in return. These spreads are open for, for banks when reserves are scarce, and they tell us that the return on deposits has to be less than you know, the, the, the Lucas pricing equation of, of these assets. So why is the, the spread open? Well, because there's a liquidity cost for, for banks, and in equilibrium, Households also have to be facing the sp same spread between um, deposits and the Lucas pricing equation of their assets. For households, it's a separate thing that is driving that spread. Uh, that separate thing is that it gives them uh, the ability to relax their cash in advance constraint. For banks, that spread is open because there's a liquidity cost of issuing deposits. Um, for households, households price assets according to exactly the Lucas pricing equation. For banks, uh, the return on, on, uh, on an asset can be either uh, high or low depending on, on the collateral value and they will compete for these assets. Um, so that explains um, those spreads. In practice, T-bills earn lower returns than interest rate on, on excess reserves. So that potentially can be explained by the fact that, you know, I flip the low collateral with high collateral. It could mean that T-bills have a high collateral value. So you, you can use this simple analysis to, um, to discuss policies like open market operations and payments on, on reserves. The model doesn't talk about discount window rates, which would be something that could uh, be active when banks are short of reserves. Um, but I think the overall summary of, 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 of the policy exercise is that there's a, there's a dichotomy uh, between um, the elements of the model that affect the price level, which is the quantity of reserves, so the quantity equation uh, doesn't hold directly because uh, the quantity of reserves through an endogenous multiplier will pin down the amount of deposits. But subject to or holding fixed the real returns of assets, uh, there is a one-to-one -one map between 
the amount of reserves um, and, uh, and the price level. However, in this model, returns are pinned down by the amount of liquidity. So these are real returns, and there's an endogenous money multiplier emerging from this friction. So the Fed has the ability to affect um, real returns uh, through, through its ability to provide liquidity. So you can perform some policy experiments. So in this simplified version, without curvature on the, on the, um, on the cost of leverage, things are a bit simpler than in, in their paper. Um, so when you're far away from that satiation point, what that means is that there are less reserves plus collateral to satisfy all the payment needs that this economy has. That's summarized by this uh, liquidity cost. So an open market operation has the following effect. Um, away from the satiation point, essentially an open market operation will change an asset that has a high um, liquidity power in the sense that it, it's, it can be used a lot to, 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 to make these payments in exchange for an asset that has less liquidity benefits in, the, in this market. Because you're doing that, you're shrinking the spreads because the liquidity cost of issuing deposits is actually um, falling. So two effects are actually happening when you price assets. One effect is that there are more reserves, therefore uh, assets have less liquidity value. But on the other hand, because the liquidity cost is lower, banks can issue more deposits, so it pushes up the demand for assets. So there's a substitution effect that is compensated by these uh, reduction in the liquidity cost overall, which allows banks to lever up more. If you increase the interest rate on, on excess reserves and the quantity of, of money is fixed, um, banks want to substitute um, uh, assets for reserves. That pushes the price level, uh, the price of those assets down through a substitution effect, but that reduces the amount of collateral available in this economy uh, which increases the liquidity cost uh, and, and, and has real effects on the asset. When you're at the satiation point, uh, in this simple example, where I don't have this um, convex leverage cost, what happens is that um, the spread vanishes at the satiation point. So a, you have the standard result that an open market operation has no real effects uh, because, uh, uh, you know, there's enough reserves to satisfy all payment needs. That kills all the spreads, so the, the, the policy is, is neutral in the sense of, of real returns, perhaps not in, 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 the, in the effects on the price level. But the most interesting thing happens for me when you are at the association point and you try to conduct policy as the Fed is trying to conduct policy from now on, which is uh, moving the interest rate on excess reserves. So in the simple example that I, that I cooked, or that I, that I worked out, um, again, there's no spread on, uh, on the real return of assets. So what that means is that if the Fed increases the nominal return on, on excess reserves and all assets have to earn the same return, there has to be inflation. But um, in, in, in Martin and Monica's paper, uh, that's, that's not possible because the Fed is keeping inflation fixed. So that shows to me that a key element in the paper is this leverage cost function that allows you to move real returns also at the association point, um, because there's curvature on the, on, on the leverage. Um, what I think is very interesting is this novel feedback um, in this monetary model, where a reduction in asset prices, for whatever reason, will increase the liquidity cost. And in turn, that will open up spreads. Because spreads are higher, uh, the return on assets has to be even higher, so that means that asset prices actually fall, which feed back again to uh, less liquidity. So you can enter shocks either on asset prices or on these spreads, or on the sorry, or on the liquidity cost, and this feedback loop will will uh, will open. And this seems to be critical for studying, you know, the cost of you know the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, the lack of uh, you know collateral for open market operations in. In, uh, in Europe during, during the last cri crisis. Similar thing was talked about during the Great Depression and, and perhaps repo markets are a good other example. So these are my thoughts on the model. They're not necessarily criticisms. There are things I think about when I, when I read papers like this one.
So there's a deposit in advance constraint in this model. And in the real world, if you think this, this, this conference is about policy or financial innovation, it seems that you don't have to be, uh, you know, never, you know, liquidity constrained uh, by the amount of deposit that you have at a bank because you can always draw on, on a credit card um, if, if there's, you know, s sufficient depth in, 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 in um, financial innovation. So this is buried in, this, this is present also in the paper because there's a credit line, but I would like to see uh, more work on the, on the credit spread between these credit lines uh, and deposits that could capture um, these credit frictions. Um, I mean, the paper, there, there's, a, there's a physical cost as well. Let me. Now, spreads in the, in the paper uh, so are, are purely nominal. They just affect um, the, the returns on assets, but they don't have real effects because the amount of, uh, this is an endowment economy. Uh, in the real world, another thing that is important is that, you know, um, sp higher spreads may lead to misallocation of resources. The borrowers face higher interest rates. Um, they are away from, from optimality. In the model, the cost of government or, or for liquidity provision for the government is physical. Um, I, I, have it, I have a hard time interpreting that. In practice, it's distortionary taxes or distortions coming from inflation. Uh, I think the big cost of inflation is on the spreads. To um, sustain financial intermediation, banks need reserves, but reserves are assets that, uh, you know, away from situations where you're in earning interest rate on excess reserves, um, are, are, are suffering losses from inflation. So that should map into a higher spread. Um, in the model, um, Pricing comes from a quantity theory equation. But in a model where uh, you have borrowing and lending, um, distribution of wealth matters. The distribution of wealth depends on spreads over time, even in a steady state, and that pins down velocity. So velocity is endogenous uh, to spreads, and in the model, uh, policy is affecting spreads, so it could affect velocity as well. Um, and then I want to finish with very, two very quick pictures uh, that I've constructed. Um, they're just food for thought. The blue is all the expansion in assets of the Federal Reserve during the crisis to domestic markets. It also expands making swaps to foreign central banks, but this is the domestic expansion in assets, okay? I'm normalizing things by zero. The red is the increment in, in reserves um, by the Fed as well. And the, the yellow is the expansion in deposits by banks. What this picture is telling me is that the huge open market operations that were carried out by the Fed, if you clean up certain, oper uh, certain operations, look almost like this. So basically the expansion in reserves almost equates the expansion in deposits by banks. So the um, takeaway that I get from this picture is that during the crisis, the Fed essentially announces that it will buy a certain amount of mortgage-backed securities uh, in, you know, for reserves. And what banks are doing is essentially issuing deposits to buy back uh, those mortgage-backed securities and essentially selling them back to the Fed and trading them, trading them exactly for, for reserves. So you see a huge expansion in deposits, huge expansion in reserves, um, but this, this doesn't have the effect of, of um, you know, extending more or having effects on loans or, or um, effects on the price level or, or asset prices. Of course, you can claim that this is just a substitution of, of uh, bigger money aggregates. So I wanted to conclude with a couple of quotes I don't have time to talk about. Thank you. Verify one thing. So, uh, this is about the leverage cost. Cause, so the, uh, what, we have, again, what we have in mind here is that uh, if uh, someone makes a commitment, and this is a non-contingent commitment, as happens when, uh, say, there is a credit line or uh, deposits are issued that are demandable, uh, then uh, there is a, 
there is some uh, resource cost that comes because there may be, uh, this may have to be renegotiated or, or there's a bankruptcy or, or something like that. And to capture the idea that the more of these commitments you make, uh, the more cost there is, uh, that is uh, something that's not new to us, but it's and to do that with a smooth function. That's also pr that's present in a lot of uh, corporate finance papers that provide a micro foundations for this. And for example, the, sort of the, the classic uh, Kashyap Stein paper on the credit channel works like this. And this is the type of thing that we have in mind here. Um, and that is, um, so, so, the, so then when you sort of compare that with the micro foundations papers that, uh, that there is a connection between credit spreads and this cost. And so if one were to go to the data and think about where do we see evidence for this cost, this is naturally related uh, to spreads. So that's, uh, and that's why it's also important that this is a uh, smoothly upward sloping cost, uh, as opposed to it is a, a cost that is kind of flat and then uh, uh, infinite, like in, in, in your example, in which case there's no spreads. But it's, so in our thing, the smooth thing that, that partly reflects okay. the spreads. Um, yeah, so that's the other, that, that's the only thing. All right, so. so thanks very much. For the, uh, let's collect some questions. We start from left. Yes, go ahead. One, two, three. Okay. Four, five, six. Um, uh, thank you for an interesting paper and interesting comments. Um, I'm coming at the topic from a non-technical perspective and observing that a combination of regulations post Dodd-Frank and Basel III have produced constraints on banks with respect to leverage and liquidity, and they live in a world in which rates of return are also a constraint. Um, I'm not sure if I interpreted uh, Martin Schneider's um, uh, diagram that reminded me of familiar ISLM diagrams, so I appreciate that. Thank you for your comparative static and diagrammatic approach to things. But it looked to me as though possibly when you took all, sort, all three constraints into account, you might not have a solution. And I'm wondering if uh, your analysis casts any light on this current concern of policymakers that perhaps they have... Um, over-constrained banks uh, by imposing, on the one hand, leverage requirements, on the other, liquidity requirements, may not be compatible. Yeah, so, in, yeah, so, so definitely, so first of all, it's, uh, it's interesting to think about more policy tools than what we did, which is just uh, this interest rate on reserves and then uh, securities trading. Um, and so I, I guess what you have in mind is basically um, restrictions on portfolio choice by the banks. Um, and that, I think that could be analyzed. I think uh, just in, to relate to my picture, um, what that has is what sort of the outside money that the, uh, that the government produces. And then there is the leverage of the banks, which depends on this endogenous choice of the inside money by the banks. What I would think what a portfolio constraint generally would do is it would change the relationship between the outside money and what possibly, uh, what, what, what is sort of the production function of the inside money. Okay. And so it would change this, what, what we call the leverage, uh, the, the, the capital structure curve. Um, because if, let's say, suppose we were to take some asset and we were to severely restrict uh, banks' uh, holdings of it, that would reduce uh, this part, uh, type of collateral and would, would shift this capital structure curve. Yeah. And so I, so I think that's how it would show up, uh, not necessarily as there is no solution, but rather as, as shifts in this curve because it's all about this, this production of inside money. How is that affected? How does that become uh, different? Yeah. Um, but I, so uh, we, we can, 
pr uh, produce more precise answers uh, for, for the uh, particular policy experiment. This is the, the type of thing for which we think this framework is, uh, is useful. I'm sure it's uh, in the first or second equation in your paper, but it wasn't clear to me from your presentation what you were what you were maximizing when you talked about optimization. Could you just explain the concept? Uh, okay, so the um, so there are three three things get optimized: the the households uh, op uh, maximize utility, the all the uh, firms maximize shareholder value. And then uh, when we do the welfare, uh, then we ask uh, what is the best for the, for the households. And that in this particular stylized model is equivalent to saying how do we minimize the, the cost of leverage uh, that uh, needs to be incurred in order to make the transactions uh, function smoothly. Yeah, that, that's the, 